I just want to show you a little bit of research we've done on the question of narmophene. Narmophene is a fascinating drug. It's a, an opiate antagonist, kappa partial agonist, mu antagonist, which is licensed to help people control their drinking. It's a binge regulator. It's useful for the people, and you all know them, some of you may be them, who say, I'm only going to have two drinks with the rest of you. And you know that after two drinks, they lose control, and they have 10 or 15 drinks. And that process, uh, loss of control, is to some extent attenuated by narmaphene. How does it do it? Well, we did this study. This is a, a study where we took dependent alcoholics, binging alcoholics. We infused them intravenously with alcohol in a, in a scanner, an fMRI scanner, on two occasions, one with narmaphene and one without narmaphene. And we looked to see how their brains were affected by alcohol and to what extent narmaphene could change that, the impact of alcohol. And here you see the, uh, the brain images, these FMRI, fMRI images, uh, of people doing a task, which is an incentive task, a monetary incentive delay task. It activates the dopamine systems in the brain. And you can see there that narmaphene attenuates reward processes when people are drunk. And I believe now that's probably how it works. It, it's quite likely that narmaphene helps people contain their drinking because the desire to carry on drinking and get completely out of their heads is dampened down because narmaphene is reducing the impact of alcohol on the dopamine system. And Jürgen Rem and other members of the Alice Rapp team have done a quite a detailed analysis of the value of treatment. And uh, this is a complicated slide, and I'm not going to go through it. Just, you have it in front of you. The bottom line is, the more you intervene, the more people stay alive. Just look at the left-hand column. Even if we had 40% uh, of alcoholics getting proper treatment, we'd save 10,000 lives a year in Europe. You know, that's a huge public health gain, and one that we should be championing. And it would be very interesting for you to do the same analysis in Australia. I imagine you have that data. What about future prospects? Well, I'm very interested in going back to the future by looking at some of the early work with psychedelics. It's not generally known that the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, became abstinent as a result of a psychedelic experience. We can talk about that later for those of you interested. And he was, so, he was actually the guy that gave Aldous Huxley LSD. And he promoted the use of psychedelics by researchers in the States. And there were six trials of LSD, one or two doses, uh, in alcoholics in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I'll show you that in a minute. I'll also just mention the fact that we're now in Bristol doing a trial of MDMA to treat alcoholics who drink because they've been traumatized. So we're trying to deal with the underlying PTSD, which MDMA is a good treatment for. Uh, and hoping that they will reduce their drinking if they no longer have to use alcohol to suppress the PTSD symptoms. But just to go back to the data on LST, there were six trials. They've been subject recently to a meta-analysis by these two Nor Norwegians. And they show an effect size of one. Now, there's no current treatment for alcoholism that has an effect size remotely near that. So why don't we use it? because it's illegal. Why is it illegal? Well, that's a different complicated story, but LSD was banned because people started taking it and voting against the Vietnam War. So the, this drug was banned because it changed political preference, not because it was harmful. But in the 50 years since it's been banned, I've estimated probably over 100 million people have died prematurely from alcoholism. And even if it only helped 10% of them, that would be 10 million lives saved. And it's kind of weird that we don't use drugs with proven efficacy simply in an, what is actually a failed attempt to stop recreational use. And one could even go further, even be more radical than psychedelics. We could actually replace alcohol. Modern neuroscience has allowed us to make drugs which have similar beneficial or positive effects to alcohol 
but don't have the negative effects. They don't cause liver damage. They don't cause aggression and dependence and withdrawal. Those drugs exist. I've tested them. We're in the process of trying to develop them uh, as a company. But uh, the big challenge is whether governments will welcome them. And when we look at the example you're going to hear about from the next speaker about the resistance to rational approaches to smoking, I'm not confident. I'm not confident that, that we can use science to improve the outcome of uh, people with alcohol by replacing it because it'll be too politically challenging. So I'm going to finish now and I just want to <coughs> remind you, for those of you who haven't read my 10-point plan, this was one, this was a, a paper I put together with Jürgen Rem a couple of years ago. I sent it to Downing Street, which is why it's a 10-point plan, because that's number 10 Downing Street. And um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's a very simple uh, paper, it's only, it's only three pages, and it tells you what to do to control your drinking, and it tells, what, tells you as, as practitioners what to do to reduce population drinking. And then next month, uh, there's going to be an interesting paper coming out in uh, JAMA Psychiatry, which has taken the naltrexone data from, I think there are five naltrexone trials of alcoholism. Uh, naltrexone promotes abstinence, but when people fail, uh, it does reduce drinking. And they've done an economic analysis of the impact of naltrexone, which shows even if it fails to maintain abstinence, it reduces harm because it reduces the amount people drink. And there's an editorial by us arguing that that in itself is justification for using it. Thank you very much. Professor Nuss, any reason you didn't mention topiramate as an anti-craving agent? Do you know why I didn't mention topiramate is because uh, it's not been licensed anywhere. I mean, the trials are interesting, uh, as are the trials of uh, H3 antagonists as well in uh, the treatment of, um, of drinking. But they, the drug hasn't been licensed, and it's quite a difficult drug to use. I have used it, but there's, people have quite marked individual reactions, and it can cause uh, some strange psychiatric syndromes, and also some odd, very odd metabolic syndromes of uh, metabolic acidosis. So I'm not against people using it, but I think it has to be used quite carefully, and I would certainly reserve it for people in whom other licensed approaches have failed. Do patients stay on MDMA? Oh, no, really important question. Sorry, I, I, let me just emphasize that when we use MDMA, which uh, when we use, you know, when LSD was used, it, it's one or two doses. So the current MDMA trials for PTSD, and, and we're using the same model in our trial, two doses, two weeks apart. And basically, they're used to facilitate uh, a deep uh, and prolonged psychotherapeutic process. Uh, so the, the MDMA experiences last about seven hours, and people work through the traumas. In fact, there's a wonderful quote from a, a US serviceman who was part of the uh, military MDMA trial that published recently. And he said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy, because it's hell. Uh, and it's very hard work. People, have to, people work through their traumas. And it, it's usually really quite challenging and, and, and exhausting. But by doing it, they can get mastery of the emotional element of the trauma and therefore uh, hopefully escape from the PTSD. And so far, we've put seven th people through our trial. And uh, six of them have stayed abstinent or have only had a one or two lapses. One has relapsed to heavy drinking. So that's, for our particular clinical service, that's actually a remarkably good outcome so far. Well, heavy drinking is uh, more than, you know, I'm not going to give you a threshold or cut off because it's, but uh, because of course it's a, you know, it's a, it's a graded uh, amount. If, we, if I was to say heavy drinking is more than say 50 grams a week or something, people would say, well, that's fine, 50 grams a week is fine. But of course, you know, it might, it's not depending on your personality or your, your underlying um, metabolic state, etc. So heavy drinking is drinking more than you should uh, and more than you need and what we should all be doing and as I say read my article the 10 point plan what you should all be doing I, th I think your alcohol consumption should be something that you register in the same way as you register your weight and hopefully your cholesterol 
maybe your uh, waist circumference. Those are things, maybe your blood sugar. These are, it's a, it should be a fundamental piece of knowledge that you have so that you can make sure you're always trying to reduce it. So your alcohol consumption should be like generally for most people, especially me, you should be trying to reduce it just the same way as you're trying to reduce your weight. Gabapentin? Yeah, gabapentin. Um, it's very little evidence for value in alcoholism, but may be useful for people who are drinking because they're very anxious. It's an interesting alternative to benzodiazepines or SSRIs for anxiety. Very difficult drug to use, complicated, very hard to predict how individuals are going to react. Some evidence that people who have abused other drugs may abuse gabapentin. Not sure it has much of a role in the treatment of alcoholism. And last one, LSD, precipitating psychosis? So uh, LSD, if you take LSD, that's probably the nearest you're going to get to being psychotic. But that doesn't mean you're schizophrenic. And um, the question is how harmful is LSD? What are the risks of, t of giving LSD to people who uh, may have a propensity to psychosis, uh, and that, that, that is true. We, we, in our studies of psychedelics, we, including LSD, we never give it to anyone who's been psychotic or got a first degree relative with psychosis because there is a risk that you might precipitate a prolonged psychotic experience rather than just a trip. But what we know in population terms is that the use of psychedelics recreationally is associated with lower levels of mental illness and lower levels of psychosis in the long term. That's probably an artifact of the people that actually use it, being slightly better educated and, and slightly wealthier. But there isn't any population evidence that LSD use leads to long-term psychiatric consequences, perhaps, except in a few people who, in which it may precipitate what was probably going to happen anyway, a psychotic episode.